So um, we're going to start. We're going to talk about uh, legal framework and legislation and what things can happen, not necessarily on a national level, but more on a local level, so state and local, what things you can do to implement blockchain. So this is, um, you know, if you, want, if you want to try to rival Miami-Dade County, then these are some of the things that you can implement. So what we'll do is let's start, and maybe each of you can take a few minutes um, and introduce yourself and um, a really, really uh, short synopsis of what you're doing in blockchain, because then we'll explore what you're doing a little bit further. Well, thank you so much for having us. This is a great event. I'm Kate Lipper Garabedian. I'm a state representative in Massachusetts, um, one of 160. This is my first full year term. Um, we have two year terms, we sit full time. Um, I'm a former seventh grade public school teacher in the Atlanta public schools. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, moved to Massachusetts for love, um, and have been there ever since working in education. Um, most recently as the chief legal counsel for our state secretary of education then became a state representative. And one thing I love about it is the opportunity for lifelong learning, thinking about all of the bills that I might file uh, to support families in my district and across the Commonwealth. Um, and so in doing research and thinking about that portfolio, I started seeing a lot of information about blockchain, cryptocurrency, uh, was talking to people and asking, you know, what's going on at the state house in this space? The answer was really nothing. Um, so I filed a bill in January of 2021. It's on the move as our legislative session ramps up and then winds down in a few months. Um, and then also in the fall started a caucus among House colleagues with a co-chair, uh, the chair of the Labor and Economic Development Committee on blockchain technology. And we meet monthly with uh, guests that we invite, both from government and certainly outside of it, as Boston has some of the larger uh, blockchain technology companies in the country. Um, and so I'm excited to dive into both of those initiatives and I'm glad to be here with you all today. Thank you so much, Kate. Carlos? Great, thank you, Kate. Uh, so my name's Carlos Stolon. I usually just uh, say that I play a rep on TV. Uh, it's a bad joke, guys. Uh, but so I come from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Pawtucket was the home of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And unfortunately, in the US, in certain areas, we still talk about certain things like it's still present, right? So Newport, Rhode Island, we still talk about the Vanderbilts like they live there. They don't. Uh, the breakers are empty. So. What I try to do is I focus on economic development. Uh, a lot of people use token words or, or you know, uh, words that get attention, but there's no definition. And in government, I'm one of 75 in Rhode Island, and uh, a lot of people will talk about, we're going to stimulate the economy. And then we're, we're, what are you going to do? Well, we're, we're going to help small businesses be able to sell, I don't know, a few more things every day. That's nice, it's cute, but that's not gonna stimulate our economy. We gotta do things that are very intentional. So, in looking at all these things, I, a friend of mine said, you know, Carlos, you really have to look at this crypto stuff. It's like, it's really, this is the next thing. Stop thinking about crypto, like uh, coins. Those are the websites. This is the internet. It's all over again. So think of the big picture. So I started looking into it and I started thinking, okay, what can we do that would, uh, we, we capture a moment, a need. Then we talk about how does that, uh, where does it spur growth? And then you create the long-term sustainability. And so I'll wrap up with this because we'll go into that. It's my bill, I want to create a green coin. We have a shortage of housing in the United States. So that's the, that's the spark plug, the, the housing. We did an act on climate in Rhode Island that says we will be net zero by 2050. That's the engine. And then the sustainability piece is, right now there's a lot of value in going green. There's a lot of value in opportunities and a lot of uh, credits if you go green, whether it's state, federal, or UN certificates. How do you harness that into something, and I believe that the vehicle is a crypto coin 
of some sort that gets that value and then you create the utility of being able to put that money back on the street, whether it be via charging stations, public transportation, or staking the fund and then utilizing to finance additional green projects. Thank you, Carlos. So I realize I didn't start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Amelia Powers Gardner. I am a county commissioner from Utah County, which is just south of Salt Lake County. It's the second largest county in the state. And um, my history with blockchain is we, um, we put marriage licenses on the blockchain in my county, as well as um, doing some voting on the blockchain. Any overseas or military members or people with disabilities have the ability to vote via blockchain. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what's interesting about our panel here is, you know, I'm, I'm from the West, from Utah. We've got Rhode Island and Massachusetts. We've got a good geographic region. Um, but I think what's great is that if we look at the local adoption of blockchain that all three of us are doing, it's all very different. So, and the value as we come together for this panel is you can look at what, what I've done in my state, what each of you have done in your state, and we can, uh, I know that personally I'm learning from, from you two and I can bring that back to Utah, and as well as any of you can bring these back. So, um, in Utah this year, we had three bills in our legislature, and even though I'm not, a, I'm not in the state legislature, obviously as a political subdivision of the state, we work very closely with our legislature. Um, we created, you talk about a, a, a legal framework and terms and defining terms. A lot of people don't realize you have to define terms in law. And in this space, as it's growing so rapidly, those definitions need to happen. So um, some of our bills defined law, created a task force, which is different than yours, which I love the idea that we can change those, so we'll go into that in a minute. Um, and then also, like Miami-Dade County, we've worked on creating the, the framework to accept cryptocurrency as payment. So maybe at this point, we'll kind of go through and why don't each of you tell us what bill that you've sponsored and um, how that lays the framework for, for your state. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, one of the bills that I filed this year would create a special commission to study blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. So um, Amelia, it's so nice to meet you and Carlos to learn about states that may be a little farther along than Massachusetts. Frankly, I think we're a little behind. Um, on the other hand, um, that's not always the worst thing. You can learn a lot um, and sort of pick up on what people have done really well. Um, and certainly it's also the case that every state has a different legal framework and some may be more antiquated and have more sort of barriers to entry than others. My sense is that some of the work that Wyoming has done, for example, in making some substantive adjustments to their laws was necessary because companies really couldn't actually set up shop there. Whereas my sense is, from talking to my counterparts in Rhode Island, our legal framework already allows for some of this to naturally occur. We don't have those barriers to entry. Um, so given that I'm not a finance back, uh, have, don't have a financial background, I thought, as a teacher, what's the best way to sort of explore this and create an environment to appropriately support the ecosystem? Well, it's to get people in a room together to talk to each other, to understand use cases, to get a sense of how this is happening, whether we're at the table or not. And so the special commission bill that I wrote is similar to other bills that have successfully passed. It sounds like Utah may have had something like this. Arizona passed a bill just last year, and I've talked to the lead sponsor there about it, to set up these commissions. They meet um, for my, my commission would meet for about a year, um, and it would be composed of 23 members from the legislature, um, appointees from the governor, from the cryptocurrency industry, as well as a blockchain company that has nothing to do with crypto, um, as well as from our higher education institutions. I'm, MIT produces the most blockchain um, graduates, I think, of any institution in the country. We don't retain them mostly in Massachusetts. That's also a problem. So, and then members from our Cannabis Control Commission, we have illegal marijuana in Massachusetts, that's an unbanked um, sort of enterprise. How would they interface with the expansion of cryptocurrency and blockchain in Massachusetts? Attorney General's office, law enforcement. So getting everyone at the table, meeting for a year, and then producing a report for people like me to understand where are their barriers that we need to address in our laws so that we can use blockchain technology for at least three way, in three large ways. One is, how do we make government work better for people? 
Where can we deploy this technology so that the interactions people have with their government feel trusted, secure, and efficient? Critically important. Then, as government officials, how do we encourage economic growth broadly at a macro level, which is exactly that really resonates with me what you were saying, Carlos, so that we are sharing with entrepreneurs that this is a good place to build your wealth and to share it then in the economy. Um, and then finally, how do these two, the private and the public, interface with each other? So we have a Mass Tech Collaborative in Massachusetts. It's sort of an engine of innovation. It's identified blockchain technology as one of the key levers for economic growth in Massachusetts. But we're still in the nascent phase of all of this. So the commission really assists with identifying if there are statutory or regulatory impediments that are inappropriate that we need to modernize. We'll learn from our experts about that. If there are other ways that the state legislature or others can be supportive, um, we'll get some good direction in that way. Thank you. I do have two questions real quick before we move on on, on yours. So one, you, you talked about a broad swath of people that, that are represented on the commission. How did you come up with that list and how would you encourage others if they wanted to create some sort of a commission for their state? Um, what industries should they tap into or what process did you use? Well, you know, um, don't, you don't have to recreate the wheel. You can look at what other states have already filed. So I looked at what other states had done. There's the National Conference of State Legislatures. It's a great resource. They have a good landing page. Anyone can go and look, and they sort of um, provide lists of, you know, bills that have been filed all around the country on different topics. So anyone can do that if you're curious. Um, so certainly looked there, but then also thought about from our own legal framework. We talked about, you know, the differences of what's legal in terms of marijuana use in our different states. Um, and so I thought, well, the Cannabis Control Commission absolutely should have a seat at our table. That wouldn't be relevant in a state that doesn't have uh, legal marijuana. Um, and then it goes through a le legislative process. So my bill got filed. It gets assigned to a committee. The state legislature just set up a new joint committee on cybersecurity information technology. My bill got assigned there. Um, I went and testified in support of the bill uh, with Algorand, one of our largest um, blockchain technology companies based in Boston, uh, as well as Cubic Labs, which is an incubator down in Quincy that's looking at lots of different use cases. They spoke out in support of it. Boston Blockchain Association, I know Mike Wise is here, came and supported it. Uh, my alma mater, UVA, picked up on it somehow, and someone from an incubator at UVA came and spoke in favor. Then through that process, the committee considered the bill and improved it, right? They added a few more seats that I hadn't thought of. So they added three additional seats that would be from the Secretary of the Commonwealth, which makes all the sense in the world. That's our Secretary of State overseeing elections. So it was really interesting to hear our earlier presentation. Um, so, you know, there's always room to add more seats. I also really wanted to encourage um, representation from our higher education institutions. We have a plethora of colleges and universities in Massachusetts. It's one of our largest industries. MIT, obviously, is a big one in this space. Making sure that they're at the table to also give us information was important. That's great. So my second question about the commission, and you talk about um, that part of their role is to educate uh, legislators. And just by a show of hands quickly, how many of you think that the lawmakers in your state or country really, truly understand blockchain well? All right, so I, exactly, there were zero hands, right? So just, for those uh, joining us remotely, there were zero hands. So how, how does the commission educate? Well, I think that we really resonated some of the conversation in the last um, panel because, frankly, we, we don't have to educate on, on you know, the behind-the-scenes technology component of it. What's really going to be critical is addressing some of the um, integrated themes that really matter to legislators. I don't know if you can go to, I did present a couple slides that sort of showed some of the buckets that I think are really interconnected in ways that policymakers would really support. So that includes, um, you know, the use cases, showing how this technology or adopting and accepting digital uh, currency can improve government would be critically important, and I can see that surfacing through the meetings and uh, the report that would, you know, drive um, the work of the, the commission. There's also this very deep concern about cybersecurity uh, and privacy, um, and so uh, addressing that and reaffirming that this is definitely an option. One of the, my other priority bill this year is around student data privacy. Um, Massachusetts is one of only five states that hasn't updated our laws around education records to acknowledge they're digital now, which is incredible. When I was a seventh grade teacher, Nothing was done on the internet. I'm sort of dating myself. Um, now, when my third grade son was learning during COVID, he was creating a data footprint that dwarfed what any of my students were doing in Atlanta every day, right? Um, he was just presenting a lot. 
Um, so talking about cybersecurity and, and the potential and the advantage here. Um, also, you know, one thing that I also have really cared about deeply is around um, access uh, and diversity and uh, inclusion. So, you know, there's a lot of power in discussing the unbanked and, and improving, you know, equity there. Um, I also worry some, though, about a new industry and the degree to which there are barriers to access for people who are less um, sophisticated at the outset, and how do we address that to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to be an entrepreneur in this space and to take advantage of the the um, the returns on the investment, right? Um, so that's one of the charges also for this commission. Perfect, thank you. So, so yours is really around education and bringing people together and collaboration. Um, I think, Carlos, your application for your bill is very much more specific, where it actually creates a token. Can you tell us about, about that? Sure. So what I was thinking was, um, how do I create an opportunity for everyone? <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and then how do I replicate? How can it be replicated? How do we create wealth? How do we break cycles of poverty? And how do we get enthusiasts and also professionals in the same space? And so again, the shortage in housing. Oh, and then, and then I started thinking, okay, how do we approach this in a safe way where we get a traditional approach and we create value that's going to be able to create the segue for the, this new approach and not make it intimidating, right? Because when people talk about crypto right now, especially after the last few weeks, it's crashing, it's burning, you see, it's a fraud, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die, right? And I, I like history. And I started thinking, how can I explain this? And so my question to people is, when was the last time you put oil in your lamp? Have any of you put any oil in your lamp? So my, but, but in the 1800s, Rockefeller made his fortune on standard oil, right? And then came Edison and said, no, we're going to light up the world with a flick. And then those who had the means would electrify their place. And we saw that if you look at the new, you know, history, you'll see that a lot of places in New York burned down. But when was the last time you put oil in your lamp? We've electrified the world and we didn't go back. Right now, we are going through a similar situation. We're going where crypto's pushing and we see a stride and then it goes down and then it crashes and then it picks up again and whatever. And eventually, it's going to level off and it's going to be just like electricity for the last hundred years. And so here we are right now at the prep, precedent, uh, at the, at the onsite, all right, at the beginning. And so I said, how do we capture this moment? We all want to make our communities the it place, right? So I want to make Rhode Island the crypto, uh, or the Delaware of crypto. I want to make Rhode Island because of our accessibility to Boston. We are a suburb of Boston, essentially, because we get a lot of people coming our way because their cost of living keeps going up. And so the shortage in America of housing is not particular. Well, the shortage is not particular to Rhode Island. We're experiencing it everywhere. So I said, you know, banks like to uh, finance real estate. Easy, right? They've been doing it forever. So I said, okay, how do we create a mechanism? Right now we have some ARPA money. Let's, for every dollar that we put up, let's get the banks to put up three, right? So if we put up 25%, let's get them to put up three. And we'll start, um, we, we start supporting this uh, housing shortage. We start chipping away at it. Then that act on climate, it said, we have to be net zero by 2050. So I started thinking, man, if we start doing solar panels or, um, or any other alternative way to get clean, green energy, and we do geothermal for heating and cooling, we've essentially decentralized utilities, just like we're decentralizing uh, banks right now, right? Uh, central, central banking. And so I said, oh, that, that'd be interesting to make the, the current utility secondary. And then I started thinking, well, if you uh, are heating or cooling a home for a certain amount of time, let's call it 10 hours, and you're doing it through fossil fuels, there's a monetary investment and a, an environmental negative impact, right? 
And right now, if you go, and if you can do, let's say, geothermal and electric, and you're 100% green, then you would be doing a monetary investment, but environmentally positive impact, right? And you're not just net zero, you're negative net zero. That means you're going to reach your goals faster. And I started saying, well, that difference, there's value. And that value, the UN is certifying in entities. Uh, the uh, feds are giving you credits. The uh, state is giving you credits. And like, for example, we pay a little bit of our um, monthly electric costs. We pay in Rhode Island National Grid, which is now PPL. But a little bit goes there, and then they utilize it to continue to fund other green projects, whether it be efficiency or uh, to be able to do your solar panels. So I started thinking, well, why couldn't we do that and create an alternative space? And so if we could capture those credits into a green coin, that green coin, now we say, okay, well, if you're going to take the mass transportation, uh, um, so in our case, it's called RIPTA, or if you're going to jump onto the MBTA and commute, uh, so publicly held uh, public agencies, you can pay with your green coin. If you're going to go charge, one of the biggest challenges we face uh, in the coming decade is we pay a gas tax to maintain our roads. Electric vehicles, as much as we love them, they weigh more than your traditional car. The battery pack weighs a lot. That means the wear and tear is going to be faster and greater on our roads but those charging their vehicles aren't paying a gas tax. They're not paying a tax. So they're using the same, they're using the same roads, more wear and tear, but not contributing to the maintenance. So we have to figure that out. I think that this green coin can help for that. And then let's say you, you, you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the benefit of this green coin. I'm, it's building up in value, but I don't have a vehicle. I bike to work or I walk to work or I'm remote. I'm not commuting, I don't have a vehicle, what do I do? Well, let's stake it, let's pool it, and let's utilize those funds to continue to do green infrastructure, right? And so now, every time you do that, what, what I'm seeing is you're, you're creating little green energy uh, factories. Each, each uh, property, each unit, each home is a factory of green credits. And those green credits is just perpetual, just keeps going. And every single property that you add to it just grows and grows and grows, more value, more utility, more outlets, more value, and it just becomes a cycle. And that's the plan. And then if it's adapted in other places, other cities, states, whatever, again, more utility, and it just keeps going. And it didn't cost you anything. That's the best part, because if I was going to put solar panels at my house, it was going to cost me $25,000 for like 25 years. Uh, so they came out to like $60 a month. It cut my bill in half. This geothermal is about $25,000 a unit, roughly. Cut your bill in half. That means that not only did, uh, are we doing good and we're creating green credits, I cut your cost of living as well in half. Uh, for, well, sorry, I cut your cost of living in part because you went from, let's say, a $300 bill in utilities down to half of that. That means you have more buying power and you have that money to go back into the community and spend it as you wish. So it's a way to really capture um, the green initiative, utilize, utilize a housing issue, and really capture um, those green credits and allow people to utilize those green credits for things like transportation. Absolutely. Transportation or... If, again, if you're walking and you have, you're building value, then mm -hmm. you're going to get a return on investment on something that didn't cost you anything. Because you, you, you heat or cool your home every day and you use energy. And if you invest into something that's lessening your cost, it's essentially not costing you anything, right? Right. And then that extra money you're going to put into the economy. And on top of that, because you're doing what you were going to do anyway, you just switched it from traditional fossil fuel to this alternative use. You're gaining value, and that value didn't cost you anything. And you're going to get a return on investment on it as well, because we're going to help invest it to keep doing more projects. So whether you get 3 4 5 6 7%, whether you get half a percent, it's money that is coming to you just because. Yeah. So uh, follow up two questions for you as well. Um, one, how did your 
fellow legislators in Rhode Island take that? And number two, um, how has, how has the, the bureaucracy that would be over that, I mean, do they comprehend it and understand it? Like, what are your challenges there? And what so, was your reception? Uh, and, and that's why I started with the oil question, right? People, uh, when they feel uncomfortable, you know, they start questioning, they start doubting, all of that. And I always tell people, when Elon Musk was talking about SpaceX, everybody was laughing at him, right? Everybody thought he was crazy. And now who's laughing his way to the bank? He is, right? Because he saw something that the rest of the people didn't see. And those of you who are here and those who are watching on TV or on, on the internet, you see that there's something that we can't touch it. It's not tangible, but it's, it's there and it's gonna happen. And so when I started talking to my, my uh, colleagues, they'd look at me and they're like, yeah, bro, like, I, I don't get it. it. It sounds cool, but I, like, you're gonna waste your time. And, and we might be ahead of schedule, but I always say to them, when everybody's talking about crypto and blockchain, it's too late. It's like, have you heard the saying, here's a hot tip from Wall Street? That means everybody made their money, right? So you're the sucker who's going to buy it last and lose. I said, I'm talking about it now when none of you are talking about it, when very few people, when people are curious. So at the end of the day, to answer your question is, yeah, people were, they're skeptical. Everybody's still thinking that this is like, uh, like when Second Life came out or one of those things that's just a fad, it's going to go away. And, and I'm saying to them, no, guys, this is here to stay. This is going to find it's medium and this i mean we're almost there with apple pay google pay it's it's the same thing it's just we're just saying we're not transferring fiat we're transferring digital now yeah absolutely well, that's great so one of the one of the areas that um that we've tried to take like a, a step back in utah you know in in 2019 was the first year that i utilized blockchain voting so I use, utilized blockchain voting for our overseas and military population you know, for the primary election in 2019. And then for the general election, we expanded that to people with disabilities. So previously, those demographics, at least in my state, were voting via email. But when they vote via email, they waive their right to a, sec to a secret ballot. Plus, it's very labor intensive because uh, they email in their vote. And then we actually have to have two employees recreate a ballot for them. And you have to have two, obviously, so you're checking each other. But both, that means that at minimum, two employees know how this person voted. Um, and on top of that, uh, it's also not secure because they were using these, these ballots. Um, they were using email to transfer these ballots, which is very insecure. So we did that in 2019. Um, I felt comfortable with it because I understood it. And then in 2020, we launched our online marriage license portal that created an NFT marriage license for every person. We've done 25,000 of them, but when I launched that in January of 2020, I understood it, so I felt comfortable with it and I was fine with it, but I was the only, I was the only place in the country that did. So what we've done is taken a step back in Utah, and I want your thoughts on this. We, we ran three bills this legislative session. The first was to define legal ownership rights for digital assets. So it's one thing we talk about is you, we have to define terms. Um, those of us in this room might understand that there's a difference between blockchain and crypto, but a lot of lawmakers don't. They think crypto and blockchain are synonymous. So there's a definition of terms. So we created a legal framework that allowed for ownership and definition of terms. That's one bill. The second bill was to create a task force, similar to what you're doing, but I love what you, the education aspect of what, of what you have, where we've taken uh, people from industry and from government and combined them on a task force that will evaluate bills. Because a lot of the lawmakers may not have the time or energy to invest in truly understanding everything with blockchain, but if they have a commission or a task force that, they can, that can evaluate things for them and that they can get advice from, then that's helpful. And then the third one was creating a legal framework that allows government agencies to accept cryptocurrency for payment, um, which in some states, that you're, even if you had a city or a county or or a bureaucrat that was willing to, you may not have that legal framework. 
So even though we we're kind of forward thinking and we already have sandbox laws and all those things, we took a step back to start defining terms, creating task forces, and laying framework for the use of crypto rather than fiat. Um, individually each, I would like maybe your thoughts on that and how you think that plays into the legislation that you have. Thanks, Amelia. Um, those are great nuggets to bring back to think about for, I'm running for re-election, I don't have a challenger. So I should be back in the state house next year. I'll be filing a whole nother slew of bills. Hopefully I won't be filing this commission bill again because we'll have gotten to the finish line. And so then it's sort of working with the blockchain technology caucus uh, that I co-chair to put together a portfolio, several bills that maybe update our legal frameworks. And uh, you know, the lawyer in me loves that you're writing definitions. I mean, that's so critical at the baselines for everybody to sort of understand what are the terms, what do we mean by them? And so when um, then you have to implement, you sort of can go back to that basic primer. Um, and Carlos, your experience is very similar to mine in terms of when I first thought about filing this bill, um, I was very new in the state house. I'd just been elected in a special election a few months ago, then reelected, was putting together everything. And I'm probably the median age of the House of Representatives, perhaps even slightly under median age. There are a lot of older folks. Um, and I reached out to a colleague who was around my age to say, have you ever heard of blockchain? And he said, no. So I knew that most of my colleagues would have no clue about what this was. Um, and I think a lot of the analogies we're using today, whether it's the lamps or email and USPS or just the internet, are very good ones and have really resonated with colleagues during the caucus because we have great guests come in. We've had the Mass Tech Collaborative which is that innovation hub that I've discussed. It's sort of a public-private organization. We've had Algorand stop by, Boston Blockchain, the Boston Fed came to talk about its exploration of a digital coin. Um, we just went and met with a startup in Boston that's looking at real estate tokenization and allowing people to use um, blockchain to own just portions of real estate to help them build wealth even as their renters to help then create enough of a, a a down payment down the road to become a homeowner themselves. Lots of really exciting explorations. And so I think just every conversation that we have, we've had dozens of my colleagues come, more staff have come as well. It's just so critical for sort of saturating our minds with the ideas um, that we don't have to be technocrats and understand the behind the scenes work, but can see how the use cases are really going to resonate. Um, and then, you know, in addition to the education piece, I think. That's so critically important from, for policy. I would encourage all of you to think, take a look at who are your state representatives, your state senators, assembly people, uh, you know, and see if they're working on this or see who might be working on it in your jurisdiction. Reach out, introduce yourself, sort of discuss it, um, and, and get, you know, start to build that relationship. I think a big part of also being an elected official or a policymaker is just the signals that we're giving to industry about whether we're open to partnerships, open to providing, you know, in, um, a landscape where they can flourish and will be welcome. Um, and, you know, do no harm is one of the things that we've heard a lot from some of our guests as well. Yeah. So if you want to take about three minutes and then we'll have time for a few questions. Sure. So I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, I'm of the mentality, uh, I've always been the person who is like, all right, I read a little and just go. Because we have people, very smart people, think tanks, all that, and you can think the crap out of things, but until it happens, it just, it can go in any direction, right? And Tierra Luna is a good example. They had it all figured out, right? They, they had everything looked at, and all of a sudden this death spiral happened, which until it happened, now they're looking back and saying, what else could we have done, right? So I'm the type of, let's go. Um, two, I would caution, uh, my colleague Kate just said, uh, NCSL is a great place to see a lot of the things that come out, but I would caution, don't cookie cut and don't jump on bandwagons, right? There's a lot of people like, oh, crypto, getting a lot of attention. I want to get reelected. And I'm not saying that's Kate by any chance. Like she's thoughtful. You can see that she's thoughtful in the things she's doing. But I've seen, when I started doing this, I started looking at all the legislation. I'm like, yeah, I can get Wyoming's legislation, Utah's legislation, Delaware's legislation, slap Rhode Island on it and, and put it in. And, and, but where, where's the merit in that? It's not original. And their circumstances and our circumstances are different. So you have to be mindful of that, be thoughtful of that. Don't just do things to, to, to get recognition. Uh, the other thing is that um, 
in, in regards to uh, what, what I was going to finish up in the earlier question was my legislative council, who's the ones who draft up the legislation, I sat down with the policy and the legislative council, they botched it. They, they, they couldn't get their heads around it. Like, when you look at the bill, and my intent and what the intent of the bill is completely, it's, it's horrible. It's not even close. It got filed, and I'm making amendments to it. Now, I've been there for eight years, and I'm thinking as to, do I stay or do I go into the private sector and can I be more effective where, okay? But the bottom line is, um, I believe that when you're going to do something, start with baby steps, just like Utah did, right? Do things that are not going to shake things too much, but you could learn from them. And then you could start getting a little more aggressive, right? You didn't start running, you crawled and, you know, all those things. And, and that's how I would approach it because most of the people you're going to encounter right now this is really early. It's think of the Wright brothers, right? Like up, up until then, we were, we were going in ships for hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, these two guys said, no, we're going to fly a, a metal bird, right? Everybody looked at them like, you're crazy. When was the last time you took a ship, right? You didn't, you didn't come here on the Mayflower, right? Like, uh, so I would just say, uh, keep these things in mind. First of all, cynics know nothing about everything and they'll never have a statue a university a, a, a scholarship named after them and there are three steps to entrepreneurship or anything that you do first they're going to ridicule you then they're going to accept you and that same person is going to say when you when you did it and when it when it's a normal part of our life they're going to be like kate i knew you were going to do it all along so, I'm waiting for that part. Like me personally, that's, I'm up for re-election and I'm being a primary because I'm too innovative. So I'm waiting for that part. Um, with that, do we have some questions? Does anybody? Yeah, do you want to stand? If you have a question, just maybe stand up to the mic so that this is being recorded and people can hear. Uh, Jens Sucre from uh, Ireland. I, I like the uh, project you have very much with the green coin, but, um, I actually worked on a, on a similar thing, so it's a real question here. I mean, the point is if you incentivize an investment, right, so people spend real money, let's say, to upgrade their solar panels or geothermal, right, then they spend money, right, and then your token becomes something that has a certain value. But a lot of people invest, so they have to kind of convert the token again to pay back whatever their, their loans are sold to become, you get a tradable asset, right? So there will be some market, just like for Bitcoin. I mean, the Bitcoin wasn't made for becoming a cryptocurrency, but just to reward people. And then suddenly a market, like somebody said, okay, we can convert it into dollar one or two years later, right? So what happens if you have like a volatile cryptocurrency, so people are suddenly uh, forced because they have to pay their mortgages or something to pay back their investment, right? And they have to dump all the green coins onto the exchanges, right? Then you, you, you set off a spiral. So have you thought about how you, I mean, I know you don't like the skeptics and you might call me one, no, no. but I mean, these questions are something we learned from a lot of cryptocurrency that these negative spirals might sometimes make these things, well, going up and crazy, right? Which is also sometimes not good, only for those who have it. or make it pretty much go to zero to, to kind of unroot the entire system. Have you kind of looked at that or? So my first disclaimer is I literally got into this about 10 months ago and um, I'm not an expert at it. So what I'm looking forward to and part of the reason I'm here is I'd love to talk to experts to help me mature this concept because this is not gonna happen overnight. This is gonna take some time. Two, because it's a utility kind of, I, I, I kind of see it like a stable coin because it's, it's pegged against something, right? Um, your, the, the heat, heating and cooling air is like your gas, right? And the solar is your energy. So those are regular parts of our life. Those are things that we don't just shut off. And if they get shut off, the government sometimes helps to make sure 
that you have the basic necessities. So that's the angle that I'm looking at because I believe that as a society, we come together when people are down and they need something, they need a little boost, you know, we, we help, right? We, how many times, how many funds are there to make sure that if you're in the winter and you're, and you're heating, you can't pay your heat, we as a community have some money to take care of people. And I, I think that that's the direction I'm going. But again, I will be humble and say that I don't know everything. I, I, I know very little, actually, and I'm hoping that others could help me. All right, thank, thank you. you. Do we have time for one more? Two, Two more. more, okay. Oh, this woman here was waiting, actually. Oh. Well, if you want to come in. Yeah. Go, go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll... Woman first. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Latreya Daniel. I live in the city of Seattle, Washington. And some of the things that you all mentioned um, first to Representative Kate for uh, the Massachusetts, um, you, you made a lot of buzzwords. We have a lot of buzzwords in Seattle as well. But I also am looking at the realistic side, meaning there are a lot of communities that don't even have Wi-Fi. They don't even have a basic tower to connect to the internet to at least do basic homework. We just came from a pandemic where everybody had to be isolated, but a lot of kids failed because of lack of internet access. And so yes, they may use their phone, or yes, they may, they don't even have a computer. So sometimes they're priorities. So how is it that we can't even have fundamentals and then also fundamentals and financial literacy before we go into blockchain and cryptocurrency? Because even us as adults, we do need to relearn that concept. And also to Representative Carlos as well, you mentioned about the green, the green token, green coin, excuse me. And you gave a lot of analogies and historical lessons, which I can appreciate. But I also want to, please let's understand, let's go back to the roads, right? Or let's go back to heating and AC, heating AC, uh, HVAC, excuse me, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. You still need tradespeople that can operate that skill. A green token cannot go and repave a road because right now we're having a strike with our cement drivers because they're not willing to go repave the roads that, right, that are needed. So how will that green coin really help the tradesperson, a realistic tradesperson, take that home to their child and buy baby formula diapers, help their child go from there? So let's get internet. Let's understand how we can seriously apply the green token to an everyday realistic life for the everyday consumer that has to rebuild the roads and put in an HVAC system as well. well I'll just say yes to your comment. <laughs> I mean, with me, I mean, you, you've heard that I'm a seventh grade teacher. I'm not suggesting that, I mean, we're all here today, thanks to the GBA, to really focus on blockchain technology. I'm not suggesting that's the be all and end all. I'm saying, you know, this is one bill that I wanted to file because I see that there is a potential, including for our kids, including for my, my children or children in the district that I represent or children in places like Atlanta, Georgia, where we need to build skills for the future and think about what are the jobs that will be available to our kids as they graduate um, and make sure that that's done with access for everyone. So I'm very much, your point resonates with me. However, I'm not suggesting that a commission or even an amazing idea like a green coin is alone going to address systems of poverty, um, support for working parents. Those are things we have to do at the same time. Um, and so, you know, I think there is potential in some of the use cases of blockchain technology to really address some of the concerns you're talking about. You know, um, in the earlier panel, I think it was Alexander mentioned Tylenol. Well, I'm thinking baby formula. What is happening right now in our country in terms of the, you know, the pa families who are afraid they can't feed their children right now? Um, you know, where's the quality control there? This is a technology that can maybe really support that and, and address that kind of concern. But yes, you're absolutely right. This is not um, the be all and end all, certainly not now, but it's still something that's happening. We can either kind of harness it and be at the table to talk about ways in which we use it to address some of the critical issues you're talking about, um, or we, will, we can have it developed without any sort of that informed, intentional work. Thank you. We actually do have to end the panel now, but I mean, just to kind of wrap things up, you know, we still teach uh, we still teach computer science, even though not every child has Wi-Fi. So we're not going to put off 
looking to the future just because we have everybody hasn't caught up yet. I think we can work on both simultaneously. It's not a zero sum game. So we do need to wrap up the panel, but the three of us will be here. We'll be here all week, folks. So uh, feel free to come up and ask us questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you for your panel.